today's forum presenter. Our forum presenter today is Faith Morrison, and Faith is um, a professor of chemical engineering. And we just had a little nice introduction right as we were getting started here um, that she was one of four at the time she joined uh, the faculty at Michigan Tech, one of four women in the College of Engineering. So we appreciate her being a trailblazer. Um, she's a longtime board member of the League of Women Voters of the Copper Country. And she is the chair of the board of Rise Up. And she will tell us more about Rise Up, but um, promoting women's uh, voting rights and uh, making people aware of the need for women to be active in politics around the globe. Um, Faith and her husband have lived in Hancock since 1990. And I very much appreciate you being here today, Faith. She's sharing with us a presentation that on um, voting rights in America and it's, um, well, I'll just say it's history because a varied history. Um, she has presented before and it was excellent and I wanted to make sure everybody had a chance to hear it as well. So thank you so much, Faith. Okay, thank you, Joan. and. Uh... Thank you to the QI Unitarian Universalist Fellowship for having me. I'm really delighted to be here um, with my talk on who gets to vote. And uh, as Joan said, um, I'm going to do an in-depth history on US voting rights. And I got started on this because of my interest in voting in general and women's rights in general. And um, I, as, as she said, um, we founded a group in 2019 called Rise Up to allow us to celebrate the 100th anniversary of women's rights being incorporated into the Constitution in the United States, uh, only to have the pandemic cut us short. But uh, we are still we're still working. We had to cancel our biggest events, but we're still on Zoom and uh, moving out into the non-virtual world uh, with just the issue of supporting voting rights. And as Joan said, um, I'm a longtime member of the league. My mother was a league member and a league president in my hometown in Eastern Pennsylvania. And so uh, it's, it's a, deep in my heart, the idea of uh, empowering voters and defending democracy, uh, which is the short motto of the League of Women Voters. The League of Women Voters of the Copper Country has a long history. We were founded in 1960. Um, and we are one of the strongest leagues in the state of Michigan. So um, yay to the Western UP and uh, for the women up here who have long reached out and put infrastructure together to help um, improve and always um, and expand voting rights to all those who have the right to vote. So I started developing this presentation um, during the pandemic and also during the summer that George Floyd was killed. And I wanted to be able to frame what was going on in terms of voter suppression and uh, issues related to some of the most fundamental rights that we have as citizens of the United States of America. And it was, in, it was a jumble in my head, you know, that I knew the women's, I had, I had put some time into learning the women's rights to vote story. Um, and I, had, I knew a little bit about the uh, African-American right battle, but I didn't know enough. And I, I, it was COVID, I had some extra time and I was really, really interested. So it took me quite a while to figure out how I thought this story came together. And that's what I'm presenting to you today. Um, and I think it comes down to really fundamentals. You know, this issue of uh, who should any organization allow to vote is, is a fundamental question. And we should ask that question before we get started about history or dates or any such thing. So we're talking about the voting rights in, in, the, in the United States of America, which is a republic. And so, you know, I like to go with basic definitions that are neutral, not my opinion, but the, a neutral definition. So I picked the dictionary definition. A republic is a government uh, in which supreme power resides in a body of citizens entitled to vote. And, than the rest, that there are representative formulations in the Republic. But the issue is you get to vote if you're a citizen and if you've been determined to be entitled to vote. So uh, those, that rule gets set down in the, in the founding document of the, or the 
the operating document of the Republic, which in our case is our constitution. So two things, uh, you have to be a citizen and you have to be qualified. And so somebody, the body has to figure out who do we wanna qualify. So citizens in the United States, who, who is allowed to be a citizen is the purview of the federal government. So uh, it has not always been the same answer, but uh, that's where we would look to, the question is, are you or are you not a citizen? So who are the citizens? Well, um, when we adopted the constitution and then um, sat the first Congress in 1790, uh, in the first Naturalization Act, we said that any alien being a free white person may be admitted as a citizen. So from the beginning of our Republic, we only allowed free white people to be admitted as, uh, as citizens. So that's what we did. At that time also, we had rules for qualification. So who qualifies? So the founding document, the constitution tells us who qualifies. And we can look at two parts. Article six, clause two, the supremacy clause says the constitution is the supreme law of the land. So if it's in the constitution and it has a statement in the constitution, the constitution uh, rules. Um, but it also says in the 10th amendment that uh, anything that's not mentioned in the constitution is reserved to the states. So the constitution does not say who qualifies to vote, therefore it's up to the states, right? So this has maybe become more apparent to all of us in the last few years as we, as we see this contentious issue of how the voting processes vary so much from state to state, state to state. And it really goes back all the way to the adoption of the constitution that we do leave it up to the states. So who have the states qualified? Well, let's go back to the beginning because it changed over the years. In 1789, the states required property holding, typically. They required that you be white, uh, it, with some exceptions in the case of um, the colonies, there were some exceptions. Uh, you had to be adult, um, you had to be male. And again, there were some exceptions before the constitution was adopted in the, uh, the way that the um, colonies operated and you could not be a chattel slave. Okay, so these were the actions of the individual states to determine who qualifies to vote. So this is, this is a fundamental question and it was controversial from the start how do we decide who qualifies? And so it's been a 250 year conversation of who qualifies to vote. And in 1789, who was not qualified were the unproperty, the enslaved, non-white people, women, and the young. So this is the outline of my talk is, uh, what is this two and a half century voyage? And on what basis of argument, of principle, what principles were invoked in order to make these decisions by various states and in the case of the constitution, because if something goes into the constitution, it has supremacy over what the states do. So how did we, how has this conversation gone? So initially our starting point is that white free men of property had the vote. And then over 250 years, others were admitted in a bit of a zigzagged process that is a little bit complicated to articulate, we're gonna give it a go. Um, and each time voting rights expanded, it was by vote, it's a Republic, it was by vote of those who can vote. So by, we started with this small group of people, the uh, uh, propertied white men at, who then had to be persuaded to change the rules state by state or in the case of a uh, constitutional amendment na uh, nationwide in order to change who had the right to vote. So it's a long story. And so you'll forgive me, I hope if uh, I can't go into detail in every part, I do know a bit more about many of the tricky parts, but I had, you know, the idea is to get out of here in an hour. So if you have questions at the end, I, I may be able to answer some additional questions that you might have. So this is the plan. There was the background. Now we're gonna talk about how voting rights expanded. And then I'll talk about the current status of voting rights. So gonna skip some of the details. It was a long talk when I first sort of pseudo finished it. <laughs> All right, so 
let's start with the the year we're talking about, you know, 1790 and, uh, and onwards um, at the beginning. And this was a very particular time in the history of um, European governance. Um, it was the modern colonial era. And in most European countries, they were ruled by monarchies. Now, monarchies are not republics. And they have a different sort of philosophy that God or a supreme being has anointed a king, which means there's some sort of familial, familial specialness about that family. And that was the way that leaders were chosen and the rules were all based on, on that. But in the 1700s, 1800s and 1900s, there was a lot of transition of economic ideas, of social and scientific ideas and of power structure. The Age of Enlightenment is usually timed something like 1650 to 1800. It was a philosophical movement. So folks were reflecting, European thought leaders were reflecting. Um, they were chafing under this monarchy business and thinking, is there a better way to organize ourselves? Uh, thinking about how the world works. There was a revolution in science. We were learning about uh, conservation of mass and thermodynamics and the existence of microbes and the process of evolution in, in animal life. And there were trials going on, including the American trial to create a republic. There was a challenge to the supremacy of the church as the source of power. Instead, there was this new idea, the power is in the people. And it was something that had to be worked out and thought about. And they, they articulated the idea of individual rights and the rule of reason. So these are all different than invoking a religious um, basis for justification of ruling and decision-making in civil life. So this is the soup in which uh, the United States was formed and then had to decide how to organize itself. So a bit of the, the lack of consensus can be seen in the 17 colonies and how they decided that they would govern themselves. And they did have property restrictions in the 1700s and they varied from place to place. Um, but what was uniform in this idea of, of individuals of property being the ones who should be allowed to be decision makers in this new form of government uh, was the idea that there was a certain solidity, a certain seriousness, a certain um, something that had to be respected in somebody who had property. What, how what exactly was the level? Was it 40 pounds of personal property or 50 that varied from place to place? But uh, it, under the colonies, and in some sense, almost accidentally, because they, they were generally a uh, misogynistic and racist societies, uh, if a woman or a black man in some, in some of the colonies met this solidity test, they were permitted to vote. There was a, can't remember her name, a woman voting in Virginia in the 1600s and there were black men voting in the, in the colonies. Uh, but that all got cleaned up, uh, sad to say, uh, with the establishment of the US Republic and women and uh, black men were disenfranchised. Um, and it was articulated that, uh, that this would this would be a different group of people that would be white men, not enslaved, who would um, be given with the right to vote. So the idea was that if you didn't, and the idea of these um, property rights was if you didn't have any property, you didn't have a stake in the government and you could be manipulated. Somebody could sidle up to you and say, hey, I'll give you two pounds if you'll vote for my candidate. And we know that that did happen in some, uh, in some episodes in, in our Republic over 200 years. So that was their idea that somebody who had a stake uh, by owning property wouldn't, wouldn't be subject to that. So um, this was the status at the beginning, but actually, that property qualification is the first thing that went out. So um, when, as I said, in 1790, you needed property. By 1840, more than 90% of white men in the US possessed the right to vote. So they either qualified with property rights or lived in a state that didn't have property qualifications. And by 1856, uh, those property qualifi qualifications were gone. So the first expansion of voting rights was white men who didn't have property were given the right to vote. 
So I'm gonna keep track of these expansions in voting rights. So our nation fo following, as I said previously, the poor, the enslaved, non-white people, women and the young were not allowed to vote. And then by 1856, uh, we left out property. You didn't have to have property. They, there was a change of heart in uh, the solidity and the um, reliability of white men of not property. So that was step one. So now the next thing I want to talk about is the issue of slavery. So of course, this is an enormous um, topic. And I'm going to ask five key questions. And I'm going to ask these again when I talk about women as well. I'm going to ask, uh, to put it in context, why was there ever slavery, you know, let's think about that. Um, was slavery a natural thing that people just accepted? Because we're talking about people having a change of heart. So we have to ask, what did they think about this thing? And what was the argument that allowed them to change their minds about this? So was slavery controversial or did everybody just think it was a normal thing? Um, is, it collected, is it connected to anti-Black racism? There are those who say that's not true, that will not be me. I will be saying, yes, it's most definitely attached to anti-Black racism. Um, and then how did it happen? How did black men obtain the right to vote? And did that solve the problem of anti-black racism? So I do recommend to you Ibram Kendi's book, Stamped from the Beginning, although it's quite thick, uh, but there's a young adult version of this that is uh, very readable. If you have a less time, I do recommend the book Stamped, uh, which is the young adult version and an easy um, read through that uh, if you want to learn more about the history of racism. So here's my quick answer. Um, why was there ever, ever slavery? And the answer is it was enormously profitable, okay? Uh, slavery was incredibly profitable. The King of Portugal um, had more return on investment in slavery and the slave trade than on anything else. It was the majority of his wealth was in the slave trade. So the slave trade and slavery itself was very widespread. Uh, in, in England, there were uh, middle class and lower middle class people who had portions of enslaved people uh, as sort of investment uh, baskets in the free world, in the, excuse me, in the, in the colonies. And so there were a lot of people who had economic ties to this um, wage theft um, a scheme that we call um, chattel slavery. And it was extremely, extremely profitable. So that's why we had it, it was to make money. Was it controversial? Absolutely. There have always been individuals who recognize the immorality of slavery in particular chattel slavery. And um, I have lots of, of background information on that. Um, is it connected to anti-Black racism? Yes, it is. Because although um, often you'll hear individuals talk about white individuals who had some kind of a wage contract um, there was never chattel slavery of uh, non-black chattel slaves. And when chattels, when the slave, when the enslaved or the um, uh, wage contracted uh, rebelled against unfair um, uh, uh, treatment by those that were enslaving them, uh, the, the strategy of the enslavers was to divide and conquer. They forgave the white who rebelled against them and in, um, in brought them into the act of keeping down the black so that they could keep black slavery because it was so, so profitable. And how did black men obtain the right to vote? We often think, uh, we hear that uh, Lincoln freed the slaves, but I'm gonna show you a quick timeline of everything that black men themselves, black men and women themselves did to free themselves from this inhumane system. And it was a long process, much like the women who uh, got the right to vote also had to work for a very long time. And uh, anti-Black racism did not end with slavery, uh, something I hope I don't have to convince you too much of. Um, and one other uh, piece that is sometimes comes out in the conversation about slavery is that the Civil War wasn't even over slavery, it was over states' rights. But I, I just wanna point out the Cornerstone speech, very famous, written, of confirmation by the vice president of the Confederacy that absolutely the cornerstone of the Confederacy was racism and white supremacy, the superior race and white supremacy of, over slavery. So yes, the Civil War was absolutely about slavery. So here's that 
timeline I told you about. And I want to show you at the top left there, the Haitian Revolution, 1791 to 1804, was a successful revolution run by the enslaved Black uh, workers in Haiti, and they won. And this put fear into the enslavers in the Caribbean and in uh, the colonies because it was frightening. Um, by 1820, South Carolina, for instance, was 50% Black. Okay, there were three states that were more than 50% Black at the time of the Civil War. South Carolina, um, Mississippi, and I'm forgetting who the third one was. So this, this very profitable enterprise of black enslaving Black people had spread and uh, because it was so profitable, it was, it was dug in and did not want to be changed. I wanna show you also that the industrial revolution was going on at the same time. We often study the first industrial revolution neutrally um, as, as if it's just scientific pro progress, but we were, um, we were fighting slavery uh, in the Western Hemisphere this whole time. There were slave rebellions. Um, slave importation was outlined in, in, was outlawed in 1807. Uh, there was the Denmark Vesey slave rebellion in South Carolina in 1822. And gradually, uh, those who were opposed to slavery uh, were opening the opportunity for education for Black men and eventually Black women. The Underground Railroad was running the whole time. So this was a a multi-year, 60 plus year process of those who are enslaved fighting and their allies among in particular um, the, the, um, the rel some religious sects that were strongly against, um, against slavery. And it eventually led to the Civil War and the three amendments to our constitution that changed the status of black people in America. So the reconstruction amendments, there are three of them. Um, the, although, although Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, it only freed the slaves in the Confederacy. So the, uh, the states that were not in the Confederacy, like Maryland, still had legal slavery after the Emancipation Proclamation, something I didn't learn when I learned about the Civil War. So, but slavery was in fact out loud in the United States of America in 1865, and it happened in the 13th Amendment. Um, and that's the text is there on the screen. The 14th, so, so going back to my, my list and keeping track, the poor had become uh, given the right to vote um, through uh, 40 years of changes of rules in the states. The enslaved were given the right to vote in principle um, with the 13th Amendment. The 14th Amendment, remember we said that the right to vote is given to citizens and to those who are um, entitled by uh, qualification, qualified by the states. So you first need citizenship. And so when the previously enslaved, although they are no longer enslaved, are they citizens? Well, this was clarified in the 14th Amendment through the establishment of birthright citizenship. So all persons born or naturalized in the United States are citizens of the United States, except the 14th Amendment, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, excluded Indians non-taxed. So Indians were members of sovereign nations, and so they were not subject to tax and they were exempted from the birthright citizen rules of 1868. So the reuniting of the United States uh, after the Civil War, uh, in order to be readmitted to the Union, the states who had seceded uh, had, to, had to ratify this 14th Amendment. And then the 15th Amendment. To put the final clarification into the Constitution, you may not, the states, although they qualify the voters, they may not disqualify you by base of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. So you can sort of feel sort of your lawyer, internal lawyer going here. The things that might have been used to prevent um, Black people in North America, in the United States, from voting were put into the Constitution as no. You can't, uh, you can't use race, color, or previous condition of servitude and they are citizens because they were born here or naturalized. So those are the um, re reconstruction amendments. So this looks great, right? So uh, the enslaved and non-white people, except for this issue of Indians not taxed, um, can all vote at this time. Um, of course, that's not exactly how it worked out. 
So black vote voting rights, and this is where it became a little hard to tell this story because it, we have to fast forward to get to when black men uh, and black women eventually did get the right to vote, but it wasn't in 1856. So um, I'm going back through my recap of the issues. Why was there ever slavery? It was economic self-interest and economic self-interest remained even after the civil war. Was it controversial? Yes, it was. The abolitionists led by the Quakers um, were, Quakers, by the way, were slaveholders, uh, but within the Quaker communities, they, they ab abolished slaveholding first um, and then um, were very notable in their uh, activities against slavery. Uh, and then these amendments that I'm talking about. Um, is slavery connected to anti-Black racism? There was, I, I mentioned the, the kind of thought processes that were going on through these centuries, through this enlightenment time. And so there was a lot of published scholarship that said that uh, God intended the white to take care of the black and that they're not capable of certain things. And these were put into various laws. So there were plenty after, even after these three amendments, there were plenty of racist laws on the books in the United States that uh, we still struggle with today. Um, and then how did black men obtain the right to vote? And it was black men's struggle and their credit uh, that they achieved this along with allies of other races. And it wasn't really until the Voting Rights, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, not 18, 1964, and the Voting Rights Acts of 1965 that there were uh, laws in place to address the last point about anti-Black racism in the form of Jim Crow's laws, Jim Crow laws, legal segregation, murder in the form of lynching, displacement in terms of the great migration, housing covenants, which we had up here in the North as well, terrorism, anti-Black terrorism in the form of lynching, voters oppression in the form of grandfather clauses. As I said, I have many notes on many of these things. Mass incarceration, which is a more modern form, but it's actually embedded in some of the language of the constitution, which exempts uh, using, um, uh, uh, if, if people are, in, are jailed, they can be denied their voting rights, for instance, all the way up through modern times, which I'll come back to at the end. So in my update of voting rights expansion, I, I say, yes, the birthright citizenship of the 14th Amendment did um, give Black people on who are in the United States, they gave them citizenship, but there was so much voter suppression and legalized segregation and legalized voter suppression that they, it doesn't really count it as having obtained the right to vote. So let's take a little sidebar on this issue of birthright citizenship uh, before we jump into the women's struggle. Um, you, you saw that 14th Amendment a few slides back. It said, if you're born here, you're a citizen. Well, uh, Mr. Wong Kim Ark was born in the United States in, 18, in the 1800s um, after that amendment and should have been recognized as having birthright citizenship, but he was born of Chinese parents. And when he went back to China, he tried to readmit, come back to the country of his birth, he was not admitted. And he took his case to the Supreme Court. And in 1898, in US versus Wong Kim Ark, um, it was in fact finally ruled that birthright citizenship did apply to other races. Um, note that in 1882, we had the Chinese Exclusion Act. There was a racist attitude about Chinese laborers. So note that slavery is also a labor issue. It's wage theft, the theft of the um, work of the black people who were brought here. And the Chinese laborers were another attempt to get more labor, to get more work done, um, but people didn't really want the Chinese to stay. And they put that in writing in 1882. So um, that was the law of the land until 1924 when the national um, gave quotas, racial quotas um, on immigration. Um, so another attempt to fight the idea of um, citizenship through Im uh, immigration in this country, it limited to white people and they effectively banned East Asians and, and Asian Indians. So the issue of anti-Black racism, it goes back to Black 
enslavement, but there was also racism against Chinese and Asians um, that was uh, rampant throughout the late 1800s and the early um, 1900s. So although non-white people, again, were given citizenship and should not have been denied the right to vote on the, by the 15th Amendment um, due to their race, um, there, were, there were violations of this through, again, Jim Crow voter suppression and uh, laws that specifically Im named immigrant groups that were not from Europe as unwelcome and not deserving of the right to vote. So we actually had still um, very serious uh, limitations on non-white people. So perhaps you can tell that's a big story. And again, I have lots of extra notes that I, again, don't wanna take too much more of your time. But <clears throat> going back to summarizing a little bit, in 1790, citizens had to be free white persons qualified by the states. Um, but in 1868, due to the um, 14th Amendment, birthright citizenship exists, but there was still voter suppression and ways around um, giving the rights that were in the Constitution. So we've talked a little bit about the poor, Black men and non-white men, let's, um, let's get to the women. So I'm asking the same questions about women's voting rights that I asked about African-American voting rights. Why were women ever left out of voting? We, you know, nothing we've said so far has explicitly explained why women weren't included in the first place. Um, was gender equality controversial? Was there some, what was the, what was the, the enlightenment thought process about the idea of women and what women should be allowed. What was that? Let's look that up. Um, and how did women obtain the right to vote? And I'm careful not to say anything uh, like women were given it. They were not given it as black men were not given it. They fought for it and won for it themselves. And did sexism end with having the right to vote? And uh, maybe you know the answer to that one. Um, so why were women left out of voting? Um, remember that in this issue of property men being left out of voting and black men being left out of voting. It was about this, this hypothesis, this picture that uh, you have to have a certain stake in society and you have to have a certain heft. You have to have a certain gravitas. And women were not considered to have that gravitas. Women were considered childlike, incapable of independent thought. Uh, they, they were really even the, um, they were the, uh, they, they were taken care of by their fathers and by their husbands. Um, and there was sexist scholarship and religious um, tenets that were used to disadvantage women. And because this is really at my heart, I think I have four pages of this. I can't go over everything that's on these four pages, but maybe you can imagine my other pages about race and other, um, and other disadvantages. I have those pages. Um, but I just highlighted a few. Sexist culture and tradition shaped gender roles. And that's what one of the main reasons women were left out. Even though they had, women had through the monarchy system served as queens and regents and prophets and teachers um, if they were of a certain aristocratic class. But some, suddenly that there was amnesia about the um, merits of women when, when the, these kinds of um, new structures were invented. Um, Cotton Mather, Puritan theologian, 1696, he needed a way to, to preserve the social order. So he said God wanted husband over wife, parent over child, master over servant. That was the natural way of things. That was his assertion. And he, he promulgated that from the pulpit. And then in the legal sense, there was coverture. What is coverture? Coverture is the status in English common law that a woman acquires upon marriage. So before marriage, she's the custodian of her father, but after marriage, she's the custodian of her husband. So uh, her, her property was in her husband's name. If she came into the marriage with property, it went to the husband. She was not allowed to sign legal documents in her whole name. She couldn't sue or be sued. Um, she couldn't obtain an education against her husband's wishes. She couldn't even do that. She couldn't work for wages. If she wages. Um, she could not be held accountable for her misdeeds. Maybe that was positive. So uh, if you felt that a woman had maligned you, you had to get, you had to go after her husband. Um, and you could, she, could not she, could she could not refuse to have sex with her husband. So these issues uh, are all part of how women were treated in the law 
And so maybe we can see that this is how they were treated when votes were of issue. And they didn't get fixed by laws about voting. They got fixed by and through the long struggle of bringing rights to women one piece at a time. Um, I'll show some pictures of them in a bit, but some of the earliest uh, people fighting for women's voting rights were uh, women and men who were very much motivated by the abolition of slavery issue. And the women found that they weren't being listened to. The women found that they weren't allowed to speak. They hadn't had an issue where they were so passionate about that they needed to speak about. They were able to accommodate their civil status, but suddenly they were very passionate about it, which is why um, the early suffragists were coming out of the abolitionist movement. And they, they recognized, they came to recognize that they weren't allowed to be educated and they fought and established schools. And those schools bred women who were willing to speak and the the beginning of this um, right for women's rights, which is often dated from the 1848 Seneca Falls Convention in upstate New York. Uh, but it wasn't an isolated event. It, it started and it was in parallel with the issues related to black men's rights. And it actually conflicted in some cases as the political trade-offs uh, entered into the issue of whether or not black men receiving the right to vote should be uh, prioritized over women receiving votes. And it caused a split in the suffrage community. Um, and so there was a split and then there was later um, a rejoining. So it was work. I, I'm just showing these slides to show that there's a ton of things that went on for more than 70 years, active uh, expansion of women's rights, uh, whittling away at some of those coverture issues, issue by issue, state house by state house, uh, House of Representatives, um, president by president, to expand women's rights over 70 years. Um, in the new territories, um, women were given the right to vote first. So Wyoming, 1869, as a territory, gave women the right to vote. Utah gave women the right to vote. They lost, women lost the right to vote in 1887 in Utah. There were class objections to women voting uh, because they were low-wage competition somehow there was unanimity that women should make less than men. Uh, and that uh, meant that the men felt undermined by that. Um, and there were uh, class objections. Working class men felt like what working class white men had the right to vote because of that property uh, uh, change by 18, 1856, but they didn't want upper class white women to also have the right to vote because it would dilute their vote. So it went on and on and it included the child labor issue. It included um, much more aggressive tactics that took place in the early 1900s of the National Women's Party founded by Alice Paul and actually holding Woodrow Wilson to account. Uh, he was playing both sides of the suffrage issue and refusing to be silent even during a wartime when women had been asked in the Civil War and other wars to please uh, put a hold on their activities because of the greater good of the nation. Uh, they finally stopped taking that line. And during World War I, uh, there was a group, there was a group that wanted to be silent, but there was a group that was not and did lead to arrests and force feeding and inhumane treatment of the women who fought for the right to vote. So it finally took place. Uh, again, fascinating story, lots of more slides about this. August 26, 2020, there was a constitutional amendment, the 19th, uh, active advocacy for 72 years to achieve the right to vote. None of the signatories at Seneca Falls lived to vote under the 19th Amendment. No leader working for the final passage had been born in 1848. It was a very, very long process. So, uh, but before we uh, get too happy, Black women suffered from the same Jim Crow um, voter suppression as Black men. And in fact, there were black, there were white suffragists who tried to calm down the fears of white men and said, don't worry, you can suppress the vote of the black women. You've been suppressing the vote of the black men all these years. I'm sure you'll be effective at doing that, which in fact they were. Uh, so the black, the white women's suffrage movement is not uh, clean hands on, on the issue of black women. Um, and this question of did sexism end with suffrage? Uh, let's just look at the date there on the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act, 2009. Uh, no, 
there are still fights. There is no amendment in the constitution that says that states may not uh, discriminate against women on basis of sex. That is not in our constitution. I would very much like it to be there. Um, and so there are still issues. And on, uh, on March 15th this year, we will celebrate Equal Pay Day. Um, as women's equality of pay gradually approaches, uh, we're still 17% behind on average uh, with what men are paid. So I promised that I would show you a few of the early suffragists. Jarena Lee was an early speaker um, so uh, as I said, women, it was considered really inappropriate for women to speak in public. And the first uh, people to speak in public were in the churches. And one of them was Jarena Lee for the Episcopal Church in 1819. And two of my favorite suffragists were Angelina and Sarah Grimke from South Carolina, who were Quakers, uh, who spoke in public and spoke in front of the Massachusetts State House and, and went on speaking tours. And uh, they came from a slave owning family and gave up everything for their belief in the equality of human rights. Uh, the principals at the uh, Seneca Falls Convention were Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott, both Quakers. Um, and uh, that the thing I want to point out from that Seneca Falls Convention that they passed um, all these sentiments that were the uh, consensus of the group. And they were all unanimous, except for the one that asked for the right to vote for women. And it passed by a single vote, um, uh, barely passed. The, the attendees were afraid that their whole mission of um, trying to get education and civil rights for women would be jeopardized by asking for the ludicrous idea that women should be allowed to vote. They thought they would be mocked and laughed at, which they were, they were. They were mocked and laughed at for asking for the women's right to vote. So following my other um, timeline, here's a timeline of women getting the right to vote. Uh, in the mid 1800s, women started to have uh, access to education. Uh, there were women's colleges. There was the Women's Anti-Slavery Convention in England motivated Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton to have that Seneca Falls Convention because they were not allowed to speak and they were segregated into this little women's behind, a, behind a, a velvet rope where the women could sit and not be allowed to speak. And that motivated them. And then uh, Sojourner Truth, famous for uh, Ain't I a Woman speech in 1851. Um, and women gradually forming groups that were significant groups, uh, like the Women's Christian Temperance Union and the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs and women's clubs in general and Western suffrage. Uh, constant pushing in this wheel to get women's rights. So on the left are some of the things that we've heard about when we've heard about history, about the March West and the Mexican-American War and the gold rush. And I put a, a, one close to our local heart here, the founding of Michigan Tech and the second industrial revolution. And yet, and yet uh, in my previous timeline, I showed how black men were struggling for the right to vote. And here on this timeline, I'm showing how women were struggling for the right to vote, which was finally established in the 19th Amendment in 1920. So here's the, 19, uh, the 19th Amendment, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Uh, it finally came into force on August 26th, which is celebrated as Women's Equality Day. So I invite you to please celebrate Women's Equality Day, um, August um, every year. So back to our summary sheet. Uh, women now allowed, except we have to put the same caveats in. If you were a Native American woman, woman if you were a non-white woman, a black woman, um, you a Chinese woman, an East Asian woman, you were not allowed to vote in 1920. So progress, yes. Uh, let's let's get the, let's get to these other issues. So what's this about Indians non-taxed? What's the story here? So this is one of the reasons I called this a zigzaggy story, right? I can't talk about everything in order because there were parallel paths going on uh, to these rights of expansion. And um, the, the success in terms of voting rights of the Civil War and the Reconstruction Amendments exempted Indians non-taxed. So what is the issue of Native American uh, voting? Um, as I said previously, because Native Americans are dual citizens of tribal nations, they, actually they weren't citizens yet, they were considered citizens of tribal nations that was used as a reason for them not to vote. So they did not get the right of native born citizenship. 
and they were explicitly exclu excluded just in case anybody was going to argue that they should be included. They were born here. They were explicitly excluded in the 14th Amendment. And they had the same racist, demeaning um, issues of gravitas applied to them, that they were childlike and they were the guardians of the white people and therefore did not merit the right to vote. And they were subject to the same kind of Jim Crow issues, literacy requirements in various states. And remember, the states qualify the voters. So um, as I said, not treated, treated to tr trusted to vote wisely. So this is the unifying theme of, of, of keeping voting away from people is not trusting them to vote wisely. So how did this ever change? In 1924, uh, through the acts, you won't be surprised to hear of heroic and um, merit meritorious Native Americans of all stripes, um, the Indian Citizen Act was lobbied for and fought for and finally passed in the United States. 1924, affording full US citizen rights to the indigenous people of the United States, four years after the 19th Amendment, uh, where women got the right to vote. That did not prevent certain states from trying to have laws to non qualify, because I said from the beginning, citizenship, you had to be a citizen, you had to be qualified. So the um, Indian Citizenship Act addressed your citizenship, but you could still be not qualified. So there are these, I listed a few of the significant court cases where Native Americans state by state had to fight to get their right to vote in the states. And it wasn't um, until a court case in 1962 where New Mexico's um, anti-Indian voting measures were declared, un, uh, uh, were rejected by the state Supreme Court. And it wasn't until that famous 1965 Voting Act, Rights Act that literacy tests and other acts of voter suppression um, freed Native American voters to full citizenship and full suffrage in, in this country. So let's talk a little bit about this wonderful Voting Right Act of 1965. So what is that? It was signed into law by President Lyndon B. Johnson on August 6, 1965. It was later amended five times to expand its protection. It outlaws discrimination against racial or language minorities. It prohibits literacy tests and other acts of voter suppression. It requires bilingual ballots. And very importantly, it has stringent enforcement mechanism based on pre-clearance criteria. So states that had a record of literacy tests and voter suppression had, before they changed their rules, it had to be pre-cleared by the Department of Justice according to the, uh, the 1965 Voting Rights Act. So as of 1965, all those red caveats were eliminated uh, from our voting rights. And uh, just a little, one more piece, this issue of the young, maybe um, many of you might remember that in 1971, we lowered the right to vote from 21 to 18. So that was up to the states you know, the age. It's not in the Constitution. Everything not in the Constitution is up to the states. But the 26th Amendment made uniform uh, that uh, 18 years old and older can vote. So on my list, uh, it's not completely. Children are still not allowed to vote. I don't know that that's being advocated for. Um, remember that one of the main arguments about um, having the right to vote is whether or not you're childlike. So children are childlike. So uh, that at least is justified. Although you, know, you could make an argument for 16 year olds, I suppose. So uh, there may be additional changes in the future. So probably many of you are thinking, but Faith, uh, Voting Rights Act of 64, um, uh, the Supreme Court, yes, yes, you're right. Something has happened recently. Okay, so let's first start about the current state of voting rights. You must be a citizen and you must be qualified by the rules of your state of residence. You may not be disqualified by things um, that have been eliminated as disqualifying for, by various pathways. So lack of property has been eliminated by all states. Um, that's uniform. Um, the 14th Amendment prevents a lack of qualification based on race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Sex, 19th Amendment. Poll tax was actually put into the Constitution as well. No poll tax, 24th Amendment. Age. If you're over 18, 26th Amendment has you covered. 
Tribal membership cannot be used to disqualify you according to the Indian Citizenship Act. You may be disqualified by a felony conviction, and you are in many states. You may be declared mentally incompetent, going back to this issue of gravitas and whether or not you have uh, the gravitas and the capability to be a voter. You may be disqualified by not being a valid resident of your state. You may have the right to vote, but there can be rules about being a valid resident. Um, there are some states that require you to take a constitutional oath or a voter's oath, and I've indicated the ones uh, that were enforced when I wrote this slide. I haven't been keeping up month by month. You may not. You may be disqualified by a treason conviction in four states. If you can't make a marker signature in Arizona, that sounds like Native American voter suppression to me. Perhaps um, you cannot. You can be disqualified. Election fraud conviction in several states, and if you are convicted and confined to jail, those are very particular rules. So felony conviction was the first one I mentioned. It's in um, most states. Um, but if you are uh, convicted of something and in jail still, uh, that's the way some of the voting laws are written. And I have the URL there for where I found that. So what is the current state of voting rights? Well, there's some good news. Um, many states are working to expand voting rights. There's early voting in 45 states. Um, they've been doing um, mail-in voting in the, in the Pacific Northwest for years. There's postal voting uh, in, in many states. No reason absentee balloting we have in Michigan and 34 states have no reason absentee voting, which was really necessary during the pandemic of uh, 2020, 2021. Um, there are, however, uh, state officials who um, backed by certain movements who are trying to challenge access to voting through voter list purges um, and uh, where you put voting stations uh, people can um, hide their racism or um, other prejudices by, by purporting to be following the rule, but still making it very difficult to vote by not having um, easy access to um, voting facilities, which in my opinion, a long line is, uh, is de facto evidence that you don't have enough voting um, stations. Um, there have been lawsuits. Keweenaw County was sued last year uh, by a group that was trying to say that because they didn't purge their voter list the way um, this group thought they should, that their that Keweenaw County was was uh, um, encouraging voter fraud. Um, that was eventually dropped. Um, broadening disqualifying conditions. I gave disqualifying conditions that are on the books now, but you can make up whatever you want, and then it has to be challenged in court if it's challengeable. Um, after all, the states do have um, the purview and then polling places. And then there are these tactics that are very famous, gerrymandering, cracking, where you figure out where voters are and try to dilute them, or packing, where you try to, you admit there are people who are not in your party that you want, you'll, you can give up on one seat in a state house or in the House of Representatives, but if you pack them all into one district, then you can have the rest. Um, and then partisan targeting of various election rules. So this, as I alluded to, this Voting Rights Act of 1964 had wonderful pro provisions and it did serve to eliminate a lot of legally protected voter suppression. And it had stringent enforcement mechanisms that were renewed time after time. But in 2013, uh, in the Shelby v. Holder decision, the Supreme Court asserted that these kind of racist issues are not a problem anymore, and that the states should be given back their purview to change their voting laws as guaranteed in the Constitution. And they struck down the portion of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that has those stringent enforcement mechanisms. And it's up to Congress to fix what the um, justices of the Supreme Court cited as the problem. And it's cited as the problem, some rules that are, they, they say are out of date. So they're not saying you can't have stringent enforcement mechanisms to the Voting Rights Acts of 1965. You just need up-to-date ones that reflect the values of society now 
because that's what Congress is supposed to do. Okay, so Congress must update the formula. That is what is being asked for by voting advocates. And that is what is not happening in the United States right now. So since Shelby, and especially after the 2020 election, new restrictive voting laws have spread across the country. According to the Brennan Center, 19 states passed 34 laws in 2021, not to expand or protect the vote, but in a barely, barely camouflaged effort to in fact um, make votes go a particular way that, that the state houses want. So I think I might have done okay on my time. I'm happy to report, uh, but you'll notice that uh, I, I, there was a lot more to it. And so if you have more questions, I may be able to answer that. Um, so here's my summary of various summaries. Uh, voting rights have expanded considerably since they were first established for free white men of property in 1790 in the United States of America upon our establishment as a republic. It has never been easy to expand voting rights. The property took 50 years. Uh, black men took more than 100. Uh, black people took more than 100. Uh, women took 70 plus years. And it was activists in the categories of Native American women, Native American uh, citizens, citizens of, of uh, non-white citizens, women, uh, Black people in general, uh, even more profoundly because of their status in uh, the society that had legalized slavery that they are the heroes of their own stories of how this change was made. And uh, there's the fight continues, as they say, because um, we are still a, a nation that um, uh, fights to retain advantages. So if a group has an advantage, we fight to preserve that. And that continues to be the fight. So for the purposes of the video, Okay, I, I want to uh, bring back up the issue of the League of Women Voters. The League of Women Voters is open to men and women and uh, even non-voters. Uh, so please join us. Um, you have a very active um, League of Women Voters here in the Copper Country and there's plenty to do. Um, and uh, the as I said, the Rise Up group is uh, still active. I'm going to be hosting a discussion of five uh, suffragists a program that was made by PBS and on the 24th, uh, there'll be an online Zoom discussion of that. And Susanna Peters is hosting a book reading of an important suffrage book, um, Roses and Radicals, uh, which is a wonderful book. And that'll be in April. So uh, join us. Um, and then this is what I was saying for the purposes of the recording, uh, there's a whole bunch of URLs here at the end of my talk that once this video is available to you, you might be able to do a little bit of your own reading if you'd like. And so there, I'm reading them into the record, like the, like the, like the congressmen do with the congressional record. I'm reading uh, the references into the record and I invite you to join me in reading some of these many, many, many bits of history. And so I'll just stop with this slide again and say, I'd be, I'd be happy to answer any questions.